Starting and running a small law firm is no joke. If you've ever done it, you're in a small community of people worldwide that have ever attempted this. Today, we're going to talk to one of them. His name is Mark Lazarus, and he started a law firm down under in Australia. Welcome to the Josh Durbin Show, because law school didn't teach business. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 32 of the Josh Durbin Show. We are joined today by Mark Lazarus down in Australia. Mark, where exactly are you coming to us from today? Uh, Sydney. Sydney, down Australia. Sydney. Very good. And Mark, you started your law practice about how long ago was that? Quite a while. It was actually a family business started by my old man uh, many, many years ago. But um, I basically moved back to Australia after living in the UK for about six years where I ran Monster Energy's legal department. I don't have to explain to your audience who Monster Energy is. So I worked for Monster for many years, moved back to Sydney in 2017 uh, and basically set up kind of my own arm of Lazarus Legal uh, and changed the whole trajectory of the firm. Uh, in terms of the way we operate, you know, the way we dress, you know, the kind of clients that we service. Um, so, yeah, I mean, to answer that particular question, I'm getting more uh, into more detail about the practice. But, yeah, it's about 2017 where I really got back into running my own show and ramped things up. I, I, I thought, you know, when I was talking to you about jumping on the show with me today, I we both, you know, run small law firms for a while. And uh, we've shared some stories over the years as we've worked together a little bit. Uh, but you okay. sent me a message and I thought it was really interesting. And, and I was just going to start by reading a little bit of it for our audience here. Absolutely. So, uh, you, said, you said, Josh, you know, running a practice is hard. The past year, meaning 2023, was a good year. My billables were up from the previous year. But as I approached 2024, we pressed the reset button. Let me ask you this. How do you continue to expand and grow and pay your staff? I have six staff now, but one that I, well, but I'm pretty much the one that brings in the work. So I'm constantly hustling and I'm doing the, the more complex work. I do delegate when I can, but clients want me, and so finding the balance can be tough. I just thought that when you sent me that, it, it mirrored so much of the experience I have in running a small firm because, you know, as, as much as we were busy last year in 2023, it doesn't mean a lick uh, here in 2024, right? We have to literally start over and, um, you know, we have, I, you said you had six staff, you know, we have, we have 14 at this point. So the payroll that's changed. That's changed. That's changed. Okay. Yeah. We actually hired two more, you know, we've got part-timers, but we, there's actually nine right. of us now. Vital. Oh, wow. So yeah, just in a few, a little bit of time, you've really, you know, yeah. you've, you've, you've almost grown by a third, uh, which is great. Yeah. Uh, but as you know, you know, you keep accepting the additional staff and you accept the additional responsibilities, you know, and you want to, you have responsibilities to the staff and their families and, you have to make payroll every so often that, you know, for us, it's every two weeks we, we do payroll. Matter of fact, I'm going to put payroll in tonight uh, after her, after our talk. And it is really challenging because you can't just ever sit back and, and, and you don't typically have the, the workflow that maybe a large firm does where it almost seems like you're drinking out of a fire hose some days. In a small firm, I find that there's a lot more ebbs and floats. You know, we might get really busy but then we might go through a bit of a dry season and it gets challenging. So is that, is that something that's been your experience or is that, is that sort of what came of that message? Josh, you know, when you, you know, when you go take your car to the, the gas station and you fill it, you fill up, you know, and I guess I don't do this as much as I used to, but I used to see how many miles I got to the tank and then you yeah. go into the petrol station, you'd fill up and then you'd push that reset butter for the next week or 10 days or 14 sure. days, lucky enough, if we're not driving a, an electric uh, vehicle. And it's like, it starts all over again. Yep. Well, that's kind of how I feel uh, running a law firm, a smaller law firm is like. So look, I'm fortunate the way I bill these days, unless I'm litigating, uh, it's much like I think your practice from my experience. So I either bill uh, on a fixed project basis or on right. a monthly retainer basis, depending on the size uh, of the client and the scope of on- ongoing work. So, right. um, you know, over the over the last few years, I've picked up some really solid uh, retainer clients um, and they just throw work, you know, to me day in, day out. And 
And look, that can be challenging sometimes because sometimes, you know, you can end up getting a lot more work than the retainer. Uh, and sometimes, you know, you get no work and then you kind of feel guilty for charging that retainer. The, the good thing about those retainers is that I know every month, you know, bag, I'm going to earn this amount of money before I have to bring in a new piece of work. And that's right. great. And I would love to increase those retainers, but it's not easy because when you're winning new clients, they don't just all of a sudden start putting you on a retainer. You've got to build that trust. Uh, yeah, I, I think, I, I mean, everything you touch on there is, is I think, you know, felt by a lot of people. And one of the ways that, like you said, we've grown is that over the years, you know, I started the practice from a full stop. So I, you know, I didn't, I, I just basically decided one day I was going to open a, a law firm. And we started by taking on clients that were very, very, very small, you know, your smallest of entrepreneurs. And over the years, we've grown to the point where now we've got, like you said, some pretty, some larger clients. And you, we may have bill, billed some months for these clients it might be between ten and $20,000, perhaps more some months. And that, that's a really nice piece of work to be getting, but it is inconsistent some months. So some months it might be a lot less, some months it might be more. And then all of a sudden that client might get acquired, right? <laughs> and they get acquired and you lose the business because there's other attorneys waiting at the other, uh, you know, at, at, at the company that bought them to take on your, your, your piece of the work. So to your point, like you can, as much as you think things might get settled and you filled up your tank for a few months, things change, uh, you know, whether the client, you know, something changes and they don't have the money anymore to pay you your retainer or to pay for the legal ongoing services. Maybe they're, you know, again, going through a dry spell. Um, and, and yeah, it, it, you, you're always trying to sell and bring in new clients because if you don't have that coming in the door, you really run the risk that you're going to, you know, that revenue will, and cash flow will ultimately dry up. Right. And, and that's, that's the worst possible thing. Yeah, and that well, happens all the time, you know, it's particularly right. because, because we're running smaller practices. It's not like we've got these anchor clients like that, you right. know, the, the, the very big Dreadless brands or the Apples or whatever, where you you, set, you send an invoice and they don't even blink, they just pay it, right? You right, know, right. With, with my clients, they were always, you know, looking to shave money, shave costs, et cetera. Uh, and a lot of my, my fees, as I said, are fixed fees, but at the end of the day, you know, it's I deal with a lot of startups uh, and and it's some successful startups of that, um, but they may have a really really good spell and then things can change. You're gonna have environmental yep. factors, just you know, things like COVID, and the next minute you've got this this anchor client that is bringing in a regular revenue stream, and yep. and it just gets turned off. And and, let, and let's face it, Josh, you know, with lawyers and and U US is obviously a much bigger market than Australia, but let's face it, there are a dime a dozen. You know, it's not in the services industry. There are so many lawyers, there are so many accountants. So unless you're staying ahead of the curve and, you know, you're agile and you're out there, et cetera, there are just, there's so many others that are waiting in the wings. And I don't, I don't, I don't place myself in the, the, the high, you know, magic circle end of law firms charging 900 to a thousand dollars an hour. Um, sure. But I'm also not, I, I don't know what the US is like, but there are a lot of online legal service providers. Uh, yet. Oh, like, we have like, that too. Yeah. Right. And, and there are so many that are just offering precedents and trademarks and various other things, you know, for next to nothing. Um, yep. It's hard to compete sometimes and, and, and be able to kind of convince clients why they need to come see us as opposed to going to these online providers. I guess the same analogy is you can get from A to B in any car or you can get from A to B in, a, in, in an ICER car that, you know, has got better perks. And I think from my, our perspective, it's about the level of service. It's not just a, a – it, it's about having a lawyer that's actually making sure your best interests are protected. And, and that's what you're paying for. Oh, yeah. And I think – I mean, I, the one thing I've discovered, Mark, is that there's always going to be the folks that are looking for – a lower cost alternative than maybe hiring the lawyer. But there's there's also then sort of savvy founders and more experienced business people that know, oh, if we don't get this right, this like we don't get this trademark right and, and there's a problem with the trademark down the road, that's a huge valuation issue for my company or that's a huge operational issue for our company. So I'm not gonna go spend a couple hundred dollars on an online service for this. I'm gonna I'm gonna spend and find I may not want a big law firm, but I'm gonna find something in the middle. And that's always been 
our sweet spot is is trying to find somebody that doesn't want a legal Zoom or something like that, you know, one of these online services, but somebody that understands the value that lawyers bring. And that's certainly not everybody. I mean, I, I was on a call a couple of weeks ago and they were talking about the legal services and I was one of the pieces to the puzzle because we just do trademark side. And someone goes, well, isn't there a tech solution for the trademark thing? You know, that was their, you know, that was, that was somebody from the company, you know, they wanted the tech solution. They didn't want the lawyer. And I was laughing. I was like, well, I was like, I, I'm not an AI bot yet, but if you want my help, you know, I, I'm, I'm here. And, and so, uh, but there is a lot of that, that push. And I think that one of the things, and I don't know if you find this, but I, I have started to gravitate and realize like, I'm not going to fight the wind of somebody that just doesn't want to pay for a lawyer or just doesn't see the value in what we're going to do here. I'm going to look for the people that see the value and understand the value or just want to hand it off so they don't have to deal with it. And we, you know, they don't want the headache and, and want someone they can trust. And that's, that I have found has worked pretty well, but you do have to go, you have to kind of, you know, kiss a lot of frogs, you know, to find, you know, so to speak, the, the princes. You, you know, I've kind of got, how, how long have you been running a Durban Law? 16 years now. Okay. So you're, you're well ahead of me, right? Um, I'd, I'd probably say it's only in the last year or so. And, and even now, yep. Josh, like, if, you know, I, I have sleepless nights. I wear my heart on my sleeve. I don't know about, sure. about you, Josh, but like, for me, I'm constantly looking at myself. I'm constantly looking at the way, you know, I follow you religiously on LinkedIn and That's I nice. really enjoy your posts and, you know, the, the, the truths that you reveal in your own business and practice and personal life. Uh, so everyone should follow Josh on LinkedIn if you don't. Oh, that's too bad. Um, it's it's, um, it's amazing when you, you know when you talk about personal experiences in your law firm. Uh, yeah, I I, I gener generally wear my heart on my sleeve, and so when it comes to you know pitching for a new client, uh, if I don't hear back from them for a few days after I pitch, and I thought that the the pitch went so well, it was a great Teams or Zoom or whatever. I I, I go home to my wife and I'm like. What do you think went wrong? Like, you know, do you think I talked too much? And, and and the funny thing is my wife turns around to me and she says, not everybody's like you, babe. You know, like not everybody sends an email within minutes of getting it or sends a text response within minutes of getting it. You know, um, you're, you're like always ADHD. You're kind of on the ball and it's always like I've got to get it off my plate. Otherwise, I, I can't sit comfortably. And most of the time, I actually do get a response from these 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 potential clients days, even weeks, even months later, saying we right. had that awesome call. I'm now ready to engage you. But the problem is, prior to that, I'm I'm like, if I haven't heard from someone for two days, I'm like, I'm I'm thinking, what have I done wrong? Like, look, you know, how is my practice suffering? And is it is it me, etc. So, um, it, it's it's a challenge, but. You know? That's a huge challenge. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I'll, I'll make a pitch or we'll send costs down and we just don't even get a response. And I'll send a follow-up email like, hey, just no worries, but just let me know if you've got this so that I don't you know, chase you down, yeah. making sure you got my email. And people just won't respond. And, and what we find is that normally, you know, if you track that, what happens is normally they've gone with someone that's less expensive or you know, they just didn't want to tell you no. And um, the vast majority of the time, it's a price issue or maybe they've had a relationship with a prior attorney and- that ended up working out for them for one reason or another. But you're right. There's when you're when you're the salesperson, it's weird because as attorneys, you're normally used to being in the driver's seat in what you're doing because you have a lot of you have to get stuff done and, and you're sort of the one in control. But when you reverse that and you become the salesperson, you're you have no control and you're just waiting for the feedback from the potential client. It's very difficult. And you don't know, like you said, all I want to know is well. If you didn't want to use us, why not? Was it something I said? Did you not like me? Was it my pricing? What that's just so important. <laughs> that, that's so important now, like to get that feedback. I did just yes. want to go back to the one point though, because I didn't properly answer it. And that was, you know, when I was talking about the size of your how long you've been going compared to me. Um yeah. and then I went off on a tangent about, you know, the, the, the heart on the sleep. But where I was going with that point is is that um I think as you get more experienced. And as you start to build a name and a reputation, you do start to weave out those really potential, you know, decent clients and those that are just wasting time. And sure. I've slowly started to get to that point where it's now like, you know, I'm not going to undercut myself or my services or my price, you know, right. to compete to compete with an online service provider just to bring in a client. You know, right. you, you have to start working out that your time is too precious. 
And yes. if you've got a client that's going to be a problem client and question your fees, et cetera, from day one, then the chances are when you send that invoice, they're going to complain and it's going to end up being an absolute headache for you and your team. So nowadays, it's like, you know, I'm pretty set on what I would charge for certain pieces of work. And if a client doesn't want to use, I'll, I'll never lose a client, Josh. I, I say this in my pitch every day, you know, I will never lose a client over $500 because Joe Bloggs lawyer down the road is $500 cheaper than, right? Sure. You know, because sure. I always look at the long term and say, well, if I pick up this client to draft their terms and conditions or their manufacturing or distribution or supply agreement, and I say 500 bucks and I build that relationship, then not, not only are they going to refer me to others, but they hopefully are going to have additional work and I'll, and I'll land that work going forward. What I won't do though, is if they turn around and say, hey Mark, uh, yeah, we've been hunting for a few lawyers, you're X thousand dollars and this other lawyer will do it for 500. You know what my yep. response to that is? I wish you all the very best. Yep. I do a lot of litigation at our firm and please do think of me when shit hits the fan and, yep. uh, and we need to litigate because I will help you. So... I guess, I guess, you know, that comes in, in any, in any business. Well, no, you're absolutely right. I mean, the first six, seven years of the law firm, I mean, we were, we were taking, I mean, I wouldn't say everything that we could, but we were taking just about any, and you know, we, we would take a lot of the less than ideal situations that like you mentioned where we knew, oh, this person might be a problem or where this is not a great long-term fit. And we've made a conscious effort. I want to say in the last six years, seven years to really what we call sort of level up the clients. In other words, you know, we don't want, if somebody wants to spend $500 to get a trademark search to register, you can do that. You can go online and do that. We don't want to play in that sandbox anymore because we can't give the client the service and we can't have the people here to give the client the service if we're only charging that. Like I couldn't afford the staff we have. So, you know, we ended up charging more and we have clients who might have worked with us 10 years ago say, well, it was only so many dollars 10 years ago. And I'll say, I'm really sorry, but you know, our pricing has changed and this is what we charge for this. And it's still very reasonable. And we're still, I mean, we're still under $2,000. And, you know, I still think from a, from a law firm perspective, we're very reasonable, but you know, they'll say, you know, I, I, I don't, you know, I don't want to pay more than I paid last time. I'm like, well, that was 10 years ago. <laughs> so, you know, we'll just hold, yeah, we'll just hold our ground and we'll say, look, we're really sorry. This is what we charge now. And, you know, it, if you want to work with us, that's fantastic. We're happy to have you. And it, we totally understand if it doesn't work. And And that's, I think that protecting your price points is extremely important because ultimately if someone's really negotiating with uh, over just a couple hundred dollars, like you say, it's just going to be a problem long-term because they're not aligned with how you need to bill in order to make your business go round. And, and, and you need to have the power to be able to say no to that, but you also have to be busy enough with other work to be able to say no. Yeah. You know, the problem is though, you know, with interest rates and inflation and everything going mm -hmm. up, yep. you know, it's, it's, you know, house prices are, you know, uh, are going up significantly here in Australia, I presume in the oh, US yeah. as well. Even even a cup of coffee has gone up like by a dollar or, or more, or even two dollars in the years. You know, pre COVID, they were cheaper. You know, when I look at, I, I don't do a lot of conveyancing work anymore. Is that what it's, is it still called conveyancing in the U, US as well? Yeah, but that's always been a fixed fee. And when I look at what we charge now compared compared to what we as a firm were charging ten or fifteen years ago, it, it's it's gone up by such a small amount and yet it's like that's what others are still charging and i'm like well yep. look, like the amount of time that goes into this is like you know 10 hours you know i should be charging four to five times what i charge but people yep. won't pay for it and, and i think that's very difficult with legal services because you know some people think oh your fees are so high but realistically they're not compared to you know you look at what your fees what you're charging now for a trademark to what you charged when you first started I'm sure there's, there's, there's not a huge difference, you know, at least from my perspective, there isn't. Um, no, I mean, it's not that big. I mean, it's not like we're charging, you know, $5,000. We only charged 500. No, it's not nearly that big, but it, it's, it's still more. And you find that there's even over a couple hundred dollar price increase. We increased prices a couple hundred dollars last year on a flat rate service. And we had a few people start to push back on it. I said, look, I said, I've got to pay everybody here more. Every, the cost of living has gone up. I said, you know, this is what we have to charge now. And we probably lost, you know, a handful of clients because they just said, no, we're not going to pay for the increase. But it wasn't clients that we wanted to keep, you know, and I always come back to that. Like we, we really want to focus on the clients that 
what uh, appreciate the value and are running businesses themselves. And, and, and like you are, I don't think you or I or any of, you know, some of the small business uh, law firms that are listening to this podcast, we're not, no one's, uh, you know, lawyers have a bad reputation for ripping people off. You know, if we just put it out there and they, oh, you know, this, they charge me this. But I mean, I've worked with you and I work with a lot of people that have listened to this podcast. And, and I know that everybody's being very fair with their clients about what time they're spending and the work that's going into it. And especially if you look at what goes on at big law and the waste that happens there and what they charge large corporations for their work, it's, it, that's the, that's the, those are the people getting taken at the cleaners is the people paying the big law firm rates. But if you're hiring a small law firm, the vast majority of the time, you're getting a really good value. If you find someone that's, that's highly skilled like yourself, um, you know, I'm sure you're bringing so much value to the table for your clients. And the key is finding clients to understand that. And it's very, very hard. Like you said, I, it, it comes with more time and being in practice, but it's something that if you pay that, I, I find if we pay attention to it, it's made our practice a lot better when we really focus on the clients that, you know, again, we're trying to provide the right value. We're not trying to overbill or do anything like that, but we're also not trying to, you know, we can't be in this race to the bottom on fees. It just wouldn't work. All right, everybody, taking a quick break from the show here to read an ad. Uh, the ad is from none other than Gerben IP, who is the sponsor of this program. Gerben IP is my law firm that I founded in 2008. We do trademark, copyright, and patent work. If you are an attorney whose client needs assistance with intellectual property, we offer a 20% referral fee for any work that you refer over, over to us. So if you have a client and you think that they might be a good match for us, we offer a complimentary consultation, trademark strategy session, you name it. We'll talk to you about the client. We'll talk to you about what we can do Talk to the client. Feel free to drop me an email. It's jgerben at gerbenlawfirm.com. That's J-G-E-R-B-E-N at gerbenlawfirm.com. And we're happy to see if we can help you. Now back to the show. So I'm going to flip, flip the interview around on you, Josh. I'm going to ask you a question or two. So, I mean, I know you're very present on, on LinkedIn and socials, like particularly sure. LinkedIn. You know, I know that kind of identifies you as a thought leader and it doesn't really bring work through the door in my experience. Well, yeah, I, I bump into people on a Saturday night and I like really like your content and following you and stuff, but yet I don't see them sharing or liking or anything like that. So, right, right. <laughs> like, well, give me a like, yeah. How are you bringing... Uh, the work into your firm and do you have fee owners that are able to generate work as well because i mean you've got 15 people so you've, you've yeah. got a few more than i do and yeah you know you've still got time to run this podcast and shoot hoops with your kids outside and sure you know, do all this type of stuff oh yeah i mean the thing and i was going to ask you that question actually was the next one you can ask me Maybe, well we'll I'll, I'll answer that we'll do that and, and i think that'll be that'll be good so you know we when we started the practice i did a lot of google adwords uh, you know, at, at, in the, at that time, when you advertise on Google, uh, you know, if you chose the trademark trademark attorney, let's say, and you you could pay two dollars a click and get people to your site, yeah. and then we had yeah. we developed a really strong website, and so that web presence kind of got things started. Then we got really into the SEO game, and we got really good at SEO. So for a while, we we pretty much dominated U.S. search. We still come up pretty well in the U.S. and internationally when there's queries around trademark issues, and the client base developed around the volume that that generated. So I, you know, I went, you do, you, you do do a lot of different things for small business owners, which is great because you can do one thing and then you can develop the business and other things. We're really yep. just doing the IP portion, which is the trademark, the copyright, the patent. So it was, it, we ended up doing a larger volume numbers wise of people. Um, but by developing a large volume of practice, I ended up getting to know a lot of different people. And it became like a surface area thing where we worked with so many people that we would do good work for them. And then the referrals and repeat business would come out of that over time. And that's and, and that, that SEO portion of it did the vast majority of business building for us in the first, I want to say, eight to 10 years. It really was an important piece of the puzzle because we generated so many leads a day that when, even if we closed two leads out of 15 that might have came in, that was all we needed to kind of keep our world running as far as you know the amount of trademark searches and filings we were doing or you know, whatever we ended up doing. As the business has uh, matured, I will say that, like you said, posting on LinkedIn, doing this podcast... These are all things that generate a very small amount of business, but what they do is they deepen my relationship with people because they get to know me a little bit better, right? So if you follow me on LinkedIn, you're like, 
Right. You're like, oh, Josh is a good dude. Like, you know, and yeah, and he, he's going through a lot of the same things I'm going through or, you know, and, and then when an issue comes up, oh, I might be top of mind to a client or to a, a referral source because they see me on LinkedIn. So they don't forget about me, right? They're not like, oh, who's that trademark attorney mm-hmm. I worked with eight years ago? They're like, oh, I've been following Josh on LinkedIn forever. Let me send this person to him. So I think it helps over time generate referrals, but it's a very slow burn, right? If you're going to do the thought leadership stuff, I think it's good to do, but that will not necessarily drive a practice by itself. So quite frankly, it's really just the volume that we started with, getting to know people, really doing good work for people, and then developing those relationships over time. And slowly that just builds on itself. And quite frankly, again, that surface area, that website created of the amount of people that were interacting with us and finding us was was really, really helpful. So you don't have any big, uh, need a trademark called Gerd and Laura on any nope. No, 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 literally, I mean, it was no, literally just the SEO campaign. I actually don't even go to conferences. Like I, you know, a lot of lawyers will go to conferences and things like that. Yeah. I don't have the patience or the desire to travel. I, I just am not a good traveler. I don't do well on the road. And so I've never done that. I, I rarely have met a client actually in person. I mean, I do a little bit of it, but I, I don't do a lot of it. It's, it's a lot of, you know, phone calls and emails yeah. and zoom calls and um, it's and, and again, I think it's just showing up and getting the work done and doing good work for people. It, it, it's amazing what that does. I, I I do think the idea that it's really hard to find good people that you can rely on is true. Yeah. And um, and I think that once people find someone that's really good at their craft and they can recognize that and then they keep you in their world, it, it makes it makes a world of difference. So let me turn the question around then to you. If Where are you finding that you're generating your leads and new clients from at this point? So I use a couple of marketing tools. I actually had a, uh, but I, uh, but I external uh, marketing firm that was doing SEO, was running Google ads, doing all of that stuff. The problem with the Google ads was I was, I was finding I was getting a lot of riffraff, you know, people They're coming in. Everybody's so fast. Uh, yeah. Or he's wanting, you know, uh, to come into Australia, be, you know, want visa, visa application. But yeah, so we were doing a lot of Google AdWords uh, and SEO, et cetera. And then we were running you know, Facebook advertising. We tried we tried bits and pieces of, of, of each. So so I'm doing a bit of that. I'm doing a bit of cold outreach. Uh, I've got a platform that I'm I'm using that's basically targets particular a particular target market um, on LinkedIn primarily. I've actually had a lot of success with that because they they basically do all the the, the legwork and then kind of sift out those people that are genuinely interested in hearing about my service. Um, and that basically generates me a few really good leads a week. And then it's just continuing to service my existing clients, you know, putting out newsletters, putting out content. Um, and, and, you know, I think my, my view is the more clients you get, right, the more uh, of chance there is that they're going to refer you. And, oh, yeah. You know, I, I, I'll have a day or two where I don't, that the phone, the phone doesn't ring. Um, or I haven't got any emails with new work and I'll go to my wife, you know, that, that evening I'll be like, oh my God, I'm really stressed out. I didn't have any new work. I bet. And she was like, but yeah. you had a massive amount of work coming yesterday. Yeah. And I think that's the thing yeah. with me. It's like, yeah, I, 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 I did the I, same thing. I, I'm the kind of guy that it doesn't matter, you know, like I'm stressed when I'm busy and I'm stressed when I'm quiet. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, I, I think that's interesting, Mark. And I mean, I, I think that a lot of people will resonate with, with a lot of people because, you know, if, every day you sort of have this feeling of whether things are going to be okay or not. And if you go through a couple of days where things aren't going right, it's really quick to forget that on Monday you closed a super big deal and that's, uh, exactly. and it needs to be celebrated a lot. Can I ask you another question uh, quick? What thing that you do that is, is extraordinary is you always you're always on the ball with new trademark filings and you're posting about stuff. It's like, it's like, you know about what's going on before the public knows about. Uh, yes. How, how do you know? How do you? Yeah. I mean, we, so we did develop a system that is proprietary in a way, I guess you could call it that we're able to monitor trademark filings that are made on a daily basis. And, um, you know, we have, uh, I used to do it myself when I started doing it because it's great content when you can find things before the news media finds them because then you are the news media. You know, I think everybody has to kind of think of a way to create unique content. And that's something that, you know, we found as a nice uh, niche and, and ability to do that. But you're right. It takes a lot of resources. So 
it's not something that other law firms will just say, oh, we're right. going to do this. It's one of those things where you decide, hey, I'm going to invest in my law firm. I'm not going to go buy you know, Microsoft stock. I'm going to actually reinvest it in the firm by you know, with salaries I'm going to pay and try to build out our presence even further by, by having that in-house capability. So uh, that's something I always recommend people do is just remember you can always reinvest in yourself and reinvest in your firm. You don't have to necessarily pull it out and put it in stock. Tell me, I mean, what have you discovered as you've gotten a little older? Like, have you found things that have that have helped you relax, that have helped you kind of take stock and enjoy the ride a little bit more as you've gotten a little older? You know, Josh, there's something that I I, I constantly need to work on. So very very quickly, because I know we're, we're short time. So I, as I shared with with you personally, I was diagnosed in 2017 with an acoustic neuroma of the stimulus shrinova, which is a benign brain tumor on your eighth perennial nerve. So it's close to hearing your balance and your facial nerves. So uh, maybe I'm not blinking properly because basically I've got a numbness down this side of the face, etc. And that, that kind of came out of nowhere. 2017, woke up one morning with a, bl- with a blocked ear. And then, you know, after checking, you know, going to see doctors and they said, you know, so you've just got some congestion, take some tablets, Sudafed, as, as, as we call it, it'll clear it up. You know, after doing but, that for a week or two, I, I went to see a, a, a specialist in ENT, you know, throat, uh, and they said, look, I think we want to run some tests and we want you to get an MRI. Yeah. Uh, and then they discovered I had this, this two centimeter tumor uh, and I had a, a gamma knife radiation surgery. Yeah. The reason I'm bringing this up is I'm actually, you know, it's well, it 10 a.m. here. I've actually got a 1230 appointment today with my neurosurgeon uh, to, to, to get the results. I went for an MRI last week. And I was I was so anxious that I, I wrote to the to the to the surgeon's PA and said, "Look, you know, I'm going last week. I can't wait a week. You've got to give me the results." PA called me last Wednesday and said, "I just want to let you know the tumor is stable. The surgeon wants to see you next Wednesday. Please relax and don't panic." I think the moral of the story, and I posted this on LinkedIn, is like, "Don't worry until you actually need to worry," and that's easier said than done in all facets of our lives, but. I, I'm highly a highly anxious person, and I realized after this, and you know, after today, that I actually probably need to get you know some some external help in in managing anxiety. I'm not looking after my health as much. Like, yes, I'm physically active, I'm in good shape, etc. But mentally, I'm probably not looking after my health the way I should be. You know, I, I I do think going out with your loved ones or having a date night. I've got three young kids, and that's full on because. I mean, we could talk for another hour, Josh. But, you know, I come oh, home yeah. from work. Well, I got four. So, yeah, I'm with you on I, that. I, I... <laughs> I say to my young staff, you know, my yeah. second job from like six oh, to yeah. nine. Oh, yeah. This is you the know? easy job is this. Yeah. Yeah. It's and then from nine o'clock, 930, I'm back to my, 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 my nine to five, nine to six, whatever job, eight to six job, right? Until midnight. But. It's intense, and I and I think looking after your mental health is is so important. I'm I'm not looking after mine as as well as I should be, other than doing the exercise, etc. But I do need to work on it. No, and I appreciate you sharing that because I think that a lot of people, you know, we're all imperfect and we're all a work in progress. And I think that it's really important for folks to know. And it's very, it, it's great that you can recognize that. And it's and I as somebody that suffers from anxiety myself, like I had full on anxiety attacks when I was in my late teens and early twenties and really had to come to terms with what anxiety was and, and how to manage it in my life. And I even find that like, you know, during the pandemic, things were really tough because you have kids at home and there's a lot of different pressures at that point too. I, I made a few adjustments, you know, like you said, actually, I, I banned myself from going on my phone after about eight thirty nine o'clock at night. Like I don't read text messages. I don't go on social media. I don't want to read anything that's going to upset me at that hour. It's got to be, you know, I'll read a business book, you know, because I love reading about business or I'll read, I'll read other books or I might watch a show that I know is light and funny, but I'm not going to do anything that's going to you know, trigger me, if you will, or like get me worried about something. And I, I find that's been, that's been really, really helpful because it, it helps calm me down. And, and so it's, it's one of those things where I think the, uh, you know, as we go through life, I just always kind of keep it in perspective. And I hope, I hope you find that balance, you know, you can sort of find that um, where I, I feel like I've done, I'm never going to be perfect with the anxiety, right? You're always going to have it, but can you do things that lower it and you find more peaceful moments? Because to me, it's not about working for a two week vacation at some point or whatever. It's about, can I manage a day-to-day life that I'm very happy with and that, you know, I'm going to work a little bit, play a little bit, take care of myself a little bit. And find that balance, you know, and, and it's, it's very, very hard. But I, I, that's what I truly work, been working towards the last couple of years, especially as 
my practice has matured and it's a little less, I have to worry a little less day to day about where the next dollar is coming from. I mean, we still worry about it a lot, but it's, it's just a little bit easier. And, uh, and I think that that's something that you're absolutely right. That if you can get, you can get yourself a little bit better mentally, it, it goes a long way to just being better, better for your clients, better for your family and better for yourself. So I think that's, I, I think the one thing you, you said that that is really important that, that you know, anyone listening should take note of is, is taking that time out, you know, in your personal time it, when you're when it's your family time. So no, I'm trying to walk in the, into the house now. Uh, we've got something called an in charge box, which is basically this box where you put all your your devices and you close it. You can almost lock it. And you know, if I if I walk into the house and literally get rid of my cell phone, um, I'm not inclined to then be sitting at dinner and looking at emails or texts. Um, and that's also doesn't cast a good you know a good light for your you know, your younger kids who are constantly glued to Fortnite or any other games, right? So you know, I try to right. do that. And if, if in the last couple of months, I'd say I'm not working as much at night or sitting in front of the TV while, while my wife is watching Netflix and I'm kind of answering emails, etc. I'm trying to switch off for a few hours. Um, I think that's super important. But I really like the fact that you touched on on the, the fact that you you basically don't look at any emails or texts or anything at nighttime. Well, Mark, thank you so much for joining us. I I honestly appreciate the honesty and just sort of pulling back the veil of like how you're doing things and having this conversation. I think you'd be surprised how many other people out there uh, are like us and and having these uh, problems and and trials and and also the successes that that we get to enjoy too. And I I would say if anybody ever needs help in Australia, especially when it comes to anything business related, as Mark has said, he's done. Uh, you know, I've worked with them. Uh, he's great. And, and please, if you know, I, we have audience members all over the world. Um, if you need something in Australia, uh, and especially if you're in Australia, uh, Mark is a good guy and Mark, we'll put all your links and everything in the show notes. So if people want to find you, uh, you know, they can get in touch with you obviously on social or, or through your law firm's website. Thanks, Josh. And I, and I, I just wanted to say, I've been working with Josh and Gerben Law for a while now. I've got a lot of clients that are, um, uh, are moving over. Uh, and setting up shop in the US and obviously getting trademarks is, is super important. So um, I thank Josh and his team for all the hard work that they uh, that they, they do for, for my clients. Obviously, you want to team up with the right people that help push and grow your own business and your reputation. Uh, and it's been absolutely amazing uh, working with you and your team. Uh, and I hope it continues for a long time to come. Um, and also just thanks for all the you know, all the honesty that, that you, you share on, on socials and LinkedIn. I mean, that's, that's kind of how I, I came to you in the first place, I, I'd say. Uh, and it's been tremendous. So also appreciate, you know, just, just the, uh, the, the volume of, of really useful information that you share. But, you know, running your own business is tough, right? It is draining. There is always this doubt, et cetera. But just remember, you know, you're doing it for you. And everything you do is to better yourself, better yourself as a person, better your business, et cetera. It's not for somebody else. And so I absolutely love it and encourage it, you know, whether you're in services business or e-commerce business, you know, it's, it's, there's, there's lessons to be learned. And I hope, uh, I hope you got, just go out and do it. Absolutely. Mark, thank you for that message. Completely agreed. And thanks again for your time today. Thanks, Josh. Everyone, thanks so much for watching the podcast today. Before you get going, I just have a couple things for you. First, if you can click like or a five-star review or wherever you're watching or listening to the show, it really helps us out because it promotes the show for other people in your network. So please leave us a rating, review, a thumbs up, wherever you can. It'd be much appreciated. And finally, as a reminder, our sponsor today was Gerben IP. Gerben IP is my law firm. We offer trademark, patent, and copyright services. If you have a client that needs any of these things, we do pay a referral fee please feel free to get in touch with me. I'd be more than happy to talk to you about your client, about what's going on and see if we can help. Thanks so much. I'll see you next time.